Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. everybody, Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you at Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can connect better with their family and friends and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Ravi, twice. First to his hearing loss from his radiation to his brain tumor, and later when he passed away. I only care for ears. I'm the E of e and I've taken care of tens of thousands of patients with hearing loss and performed over 10,000 ear surgeries over the past 20 years. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Centers and an author of the book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. I'm excited. We have Dr. Lee no, I'm Reed. Sorry, Dr. Reed Rosenman mm-hmm. is an audiologist in the state of New Jersey and New York. She's an owner and founder of Hearing Doctors in New Jersey, a provider of personalized approach to hearing using the latest hearing health technology and techniques. She's been in the healthcare field for two decades, and we're excited to learn about her processes and insights. Reed, thank you for coming on. Sorry about that. I was just, I was <laughs> my name there. is, <laughs> my name is hard to re- to say. It's okay. I get it a lot. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the uh, podcast. This is great. I'm looking forward to talking it about everything and diving in further on so how we tell, can. Tell me a little bit about your, your, your philosophies and things. In other words, like, so, you know, uh, kind of how your journey has been, you know, getting into hearing and what you learned. Well, um, I got into hearing a long time ago. And I was in the world of graduated from college and didn't know what the heck I was going to do with my life. And then I eventually went back to grad school and I found the career of audiology through a good family friend who was an ear, nose and throat doctor, actually. And through through going back to school, I always audiology as a profession has always been something that was like an aha moment for me because I love helping people. That's Ever since I was little, I always enjoyed going to nursing homes. I was that kid in middle and high school who was like, I want to volunteer. And I always found like listening to adults and older people and their journeys and their life stories was something that was important. And um, hearing is a big part of that and being able to communicate. And through, through audiology, audiology is the kind of profession that we're able to make a very tangible improvement in people's life and their quality of life. And that's truly what I love. It makes me smile every day being able to come to work because I change people's lives through better hearing every single day. That's wonderful. I can really sense your passion about it. So I I really think that's wonderful. And so, um, you know, tell me about your practice. In other words, how did you end up going into your practice? And then, so what are some of the things that you learned and adopted in your patient care method? Yeah, so my evolution, my journey to where I am today is a long winding one. I went to grad school in Manhattan and I practiced in New York City for many years. Um, I was on, in Madison Avenue for a long time at a private uh, audiology practice that dispensed hearing aids. And through my career, I always knew that there was a better way to do it. And I never wanted to be a salesperson. And it always made me cringe when somebody would say, oh, you're you're such a good salesperson. You sell hearing aids. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. And so as, as as I evolved as an audiologist, as a provider, I really relied heavily on what, what best practices are out there and try to make sense of it. And Through my journey, I live in New Jersey now. So I was practicing in Manhattan and I started working at another practice in New Jersey. I really, I really, it didn't, the practice I was at in New Jersey was a hearing aid dispensing practice and it was run by a dispenser, which is fine. But it really felt like there was no reason why when you're doing, when you're making recommendations and it wasn't evidence-based. And so when the pandemic hit, which we know in March of 2020, I had an opportunity to really stop what I was doing and think about what was the best way to care for patients. 
and treat them medically with their for their hearing loss. And so out of the pandemic grew hearing doctors of New Jersey. So I've been in pretty young practice where we celebrated two years in practice and we've been growing quite a lot. But what we did and what I did was I developed a hear method treatment program that's a proprietary method that we practice here. And it really focuses on evidence-based testing to make proper recommendations for treating someone's hearing loss. And through our testing protocol, which looks at a lot of different things, we educate the patient, but we also are able to differentiate about how to medically treat your hearing loss. Um, And through that testing protocol that we've established, it's not about the widget. It's not about the hearing aid. It's about what's the best solution for them. So I made a really clear understanding in my head when or decision that when I start, when I opened hearing doctors of New Jersey, I wasn't going to be beholden to a manufacturer. I didn't want that because I think that everyone has their own interests, which is fine and respect. I respect that, but it didn't really have a place in my practice because I wanted to make sure that whatever was recommended for the patient was in the patient's best interest and not because that's what I thought was best. It truly is through the testing protocol that we have in place. The best is what's the best. And I don't care who makes it, if it's Resound, Oticon, Starkey, Widex, Phonak, whatever, but they're going to hear better. And because of the testing protocol that we have established that hear method treatment program, we, we rarely have people that return their hearing aid. And if, not, if anything, it's, it works because it takes the guesswork out of treating their hearing loss. And they know when they come in that they're going to hear better when they leave. I think that's awesome. I mean, you have no idea how aligned we are philosophically. I, I think that's just wonderful and a great articulation. And so say I'm hearing loss, Harry. And I and and I and I know I understand that there's a testing thing, but I I sense that it's likely that we're going to stumble on a lot of other things that are a little bit different than mm-hmm. you know, perhaps what I would call what you described the shop that you worked at before or the store right. that you worked at before. So so I'm hearing loss, Harry, right? And so how would I stumble across you or come across you that might be different? In other words, you know, what are you looking for or who are you trying to attract? And, and how do you do that? I mean, I, I'm just going to start from the beginning, attraction into engagement. And you know what I'm saying? So are you talking about for a patient? Like here yeah, it's Harry. Yeah, I'm Harry. How are you reaching out to me? I mean, you're telling me that, you know what I'm saying? I mean. Yeah, yeah so I'll just add that my son's name is Harry. So it made yeah. me a little. Oh, that's great. That's, that's great. <laughs> Hearing loss Harry. Oh, it's just there's actually... alliteration, right? So. <laughs> Hearing loss Harry. My son had two. So that was, <laughs> that was hearing loss Harry. Um, So I rely on education. I am not somebody that was going to do pay-per-click ads. And really, I I wanted to grow this practice organically because one, no one was backing me, right? Like I did this with my own money. And two, Um, you started at probably one of the worst times to start a practice (laughs) at the beginning. I'm not. And we'll leave it at that, but uh, I hear you. It's great. <laughs> and it's been, it's been wonderful. And like everyone, just as an aside, everyone has said, like, you're the only person that's opening a business in the middle of a pandemic when people are getting like funds to start company, you know, keep right, right. companies. That uh-huh. was not me. Right. Um, but hearing loss, Harry. So hearing loss, Harry um, is going to see I rely on education and only through education can we further and advance what we do sure. because the more informed a person is, the they're they're more prepared and educated, right? Sure. Sure. So be an authority in educating patients. Um, and I use social media because it's free, right? Sure. And um, I wrote lots of emails, so I worked on an email on my email list and any patient, because that's an organic way of education as well. So I would do videos. um, I would write my emails and really not with like, you need to, you need to buy hearing aids. And these are the reasons why, but talk about the cognitive aspects of untreated hearing loss and educate like 
the links between between Parkinson's and hearing loss. And whatever comes across my um, radar in articles, I'm going to talk about it and push that education piece further along so that people know, because I think that our profession has really gone down a rabbit hole of like the audiogram and the hearing aid. And we do so much more than that, right? We are specialists as an audiologist. We have doctorates in audiology. We have lots of different things that we can do, but it's become very narrow and we need to make sure that we're covering everything because we are experts in the field of audiology. And that doesn't just mean the expert at selling a hearing aid. That's not what we do. And it should never have been what we did, but a lot of practices rely on that, unfortunately. And so I made a decision when I started hearing doctors of New Jersey that we were going to focus on how our brain hears and treat hearing loss in all aspects of hearing needs for our patients. So it's not just the hearing aid that we do in our practice. Yes, that's a big part and treating hearing loss, but it's also auditory processing, it's wax removal, it's tinnitus eval, because we can do all of that. That's in our scope of practice. And so we need to make sure that we're setting up a practice that's not a shop. Right. It's, right. And that's what right. I was, right. And so I come to you. And so what is the conversation uh, talk about, I guess, where I have difficulty hearing and that type of uh, assessment? Um. So when you have difficulty hearing and you come in? Yeah. Okay. So when somebody comes in, they've been educated prior to their appointment. They know what we do. They've received information about how we treat hearing loss. And they're an educated patient. And throughout the appointment, too, we're constantly educating them on the importance of treating their hearing loss and that treating your hearing loss is not just getting a hearing aid because that one time that you purchase a hearing aid is not not going to fix it right it's it's part of it it's a big part of it but there's maintenance there's care there's testing that needs to go on there's adjustments that need to happen there's all these other things and so the technology piece is one part of it and we're constantly educating and answering the why so that the patient journey in our office is they know, they know the importance of what, what's going on. They're with a family member. They're, they're understanding the importance of hearing better because it affects not just their relationships or their, their interpersonal relationships. It affects their overall health. It makes them 200 to 500 times more likely to develop dementia. It makes them more 140 times more likely to fall like all these other things that are important. And so um, when you do uh, your initial uh, testing, okay, so I get it. So you do the audiogram, I assume. Mm-hmm. What other assessments are you doing? Are you doing surveys or are you doing, I mean, I'm just, you know, what, what's that look like? And so yeah, now so, this is shop talk. So hearing loss, Harry might not understand, but you know what right. I'm saying. Hearing loss, Harry wouldn't understand, but again, we don't rely solely on the audiogram because I think that the audiogram is so the last year. <laughs> of certain tests, right? What? The graphical representation of certain values, but it doesn't really paint a whole picture of their hearing. So what else do you do in, in addition to that? Yeah. So we do admittance testing. We do OAE testing. We do audiogram. We do Cognaview. Um, We do hearing and noise testing, like all these other things so that we really have a much more comprehensive picture of that person's hearing health and are educating them throughout like why we're doing this test, why we're doing, because we want to rule out when we look in their ear with otoscopy, why we're ruling out that wax is the reason why you're struggling to hear. Oh, you're here. here. So let's rule out like that fluid isn't the reason. And so through, through that whole process, we're talking about hearing loss, but we're educating them as well. And, um, yeah, so 
the evaluation is very extensive because we don't rely solely on that audiogram. Sure, and I agree a thousand percent, right? There's many more tools and many more ways to assess people. You know, uh, for the listeners, Cognitive View is kind of an automated cognitive screening tool. Uh, OAEs are to measure kind of the health of the cochlea. I mean, there's various ways along the hearing pathway that uh, re is testing, which makes total sense because you're assessing their whole function, not just a graphical representation of their hearing at certain frequencies, which is essentially what an audiogram is, right? And right. So, and so somebody comes in and how else do you assess them I mean, in terms of, I mean, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm really fascinated with your evolution and where you are. So in terms of, um, you know, when you talk to the patients, what other things are you looking for in terms of just the interview and, and things like that? What are you trying Yeah. To so about? obviously we're taking a hearing health and, you know, interviewing, if you will, but asking them lots and lots of questions. Um, we really, one of the big things that I have come to learn in more recent years is that our ears are not what our ears hear, but it's our brain that understands. Correct. Yes. And I've kind of known that for a long time, but I never really was able to tangibly with put it into like synthesize that. I always well, knew. I think it hasn't been articulated well in our profession until recently as well. Oh, so. It hasn't at all. And I'll go, I can tell you a story about my student that I have. But um, I think firsthand, I noticed that my grandmother had, you know, 15 years ago, she was one of my patients and she got hearing aids, she got wide X hearing aids. It was great. She was so proud. And then eventually she developed, unfortunately, she developed dementia. And for reasons that were beyond my control, she was not wearing her hearing. And I saw firsthand my grandma go from like the sassy grandma Esther to not knowing who we were, right? So she was calling my son, Harry, a cat. Um, and that was heartbreaking. But yeah. I also knew that like she was so disconnected when she wasn't wearing her hearing aid. And so while I hadn't like the understanding that I do today, I knew that cognitive decline and hearing loss are very intimately related and that it's not just the audiogram that measures how we hear. There has to be something higher level. And they don't teach that in grad school, right? They talk about the audiogram and maybe the, some professors may talk about anything above this. But what I've come to learn is that through lots of research, reading articles and talking to other professionals, we don't hear with our ears, we hear with our brain. And when you start to take a step back and look at that in terms of how we can care for our patients better and that we need to evaluate their brain, we need to evaluate how their hearing is impacting them. And then also to establish the right treatment for them, right? It's not about putting a hearing aid on and magically it's gonna work. It's about finding the right one. So that we we do a lot of testing in this office because through that testing protocol, through the HEAR method, we can figure those things out. And patients are often like shocked at what can happen if you're not fit with the right device. Because it's not, it's not the my recommendation anymore as to it's what the testing's recommendation. The testing, it's the testing, it's evidence. Right. And so, you know, it's actually kind of interesting. So I, I'm going to ask you this question because we both have a goal of the same outcome, where, which is treating the hearing as best as possible. And so we could kind of go through all of the process of selecting the technology. Problem is, honestly, it gets too like we're both in the weeds too much, if that makes sense. Like it's about specificity of this particular technology today. So talk about the method that you're talking about. In other words, so with the treating them as best as possible, what testing or what evaluations do you do to validate that through the process of selecting the right technology? And I totally get what you're talking about. Like, you know, I just tell patients, you know, there's no single car manufacturer that makes the best model of everything, meaning from subcompact to compact, to midsize, to intermediate, to full size, to luxury, to SUV, to van, to minivan, to pickup truck, there's no manufacturer. And so it's the same for hearing aids, right? And so you want access to all the different manufacturers to give the best solution possible. But once you pick that, and some of that's based, that's kind of frankly part of the secret sauce of being an audiologist is being an expert on the technology. Part. No, I would disagree. And that's where I differ. Okay, I fair. don't think I that we, we can be experts on how to use the software, 
on how to program hearing aids, how to understand those devices are super complex and don't right. even get me started on like how people think that they're going to be able to do that right. and how real ear verification is key, right? But those things aside, it's not us and what we're familiar with and because we're the experts. I have a fourth year student now who um, she asks the same question to every single supervisor that she's been working on uh, supervised with. And basically she asks, how do you know the hearing aid that you're recommending for the patient is the right hearing aid and it's going to work for them? That's and great. the answer to every single question, every time she's asked it, has been you learn with experience what works and what doesn't. That I disagree with. I, I so I think I did not say that as as well. Uh, what I meant was, you know, sometimes people start talking about, let's say, channels and sound compression and noise filter wow. and all of that bells and whistles and features, right? And so that's where I was saying I, I we don't want to go down that particular yeah. avenue. I agree with you 100. percent So that actually I assume is the question that the hear method answers, right? In other yeah. words, how yes. How do you figure that out? And this is great because then hopefully, you know, you become a uh, preacher of the of the truth, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So help me understand. And I, I love that you challenged me on that because I want to make sure I agree with exactly what you're saying about the technology. Uh, and that is the the misfocus on the widget, as you uh, said earlier. And I agree a thousand percent. It's not the technology, it's the treatment. So that actual method, the here method is what we do, that testing protocol to finally answer her question. And she was like, oh my God, this is it. Like answered it and it was easy and it was so obvious. But we test in noise with lots of different devices because we know that your brain is what hears. We take the time, our appointments are long. Um, Our evaluations are about an hour and a half. We spend with our patients to go through everything and we test them. We test and test and test. And then through that testing with a few different hearing aids, right? We can test them and say, this is what you hear without, this is what you hear with. Look, this one actually made it worse. Maybe you came in with an over-the-counter hearing aid or someone else is here, somewhere else that you were fit and you've been struggling. I had a patient come in who, um, she said to her son, I have these $7,000 hearing aids and I don't hear well with them. When I take them out, I hear better. Yeah, she and, she's seven thousand dollar earplug. Right, and <laughs> and they were great hearing aids. I work with those hearing aids, but when we did the testing, what it showed was that she was right. She was a hundred percent right. Her scores went from her score got worse in noise. It got worse with her own hearing aids, but we were actually able to test her with a lot of different things as well and establish what the best one was for her because her brain is what hears, right? And so is that the quick scene you're doing or something of that nature? Yeah. And yeah. so the other question I have for you is, so that particular circumstance, how often are you finding that it's the device as compared to the settings on the, or the prescription within the device? Every single time. It's Every de- single time. It's the device because we program them. I just... No, but they're doing else's programming, not yours. What? So, so this what we do for for apples to apples uh-huh. is we rely on the best fit. So okay. we we rely on the best fit. It's quick and dirty. We program them and put them back in the booth and test right. them. So read what I'm actually, and, and I get your process, right? So what you're telling me is, is when this nice lady comes in, you get them programmed as best as possible. Then you test her and then you test her programmed as best as possible with other instruments. I get that. I guess what I was getting at is, is how often, which I suspect is unfortunately often, does somebody come in dissatisfied with their current technology? Not only might it not be the best hearing aid for them, but it also is not appropriately adjusted. Or oh. I don't know. That's what I, that's what I was getting at. Um, <laughs> yeah. The rule will not be exception, correct? Yeah, I would say um, there's a lot of incorrect programming, but hey, I don't know what they, and I never want to throw another provider under the bus. I don't know what the conversation was with that provider as to what adjustments they actually made. Yeah, I I hear you. I I will tell you philosophically, I think that, you know, so, I mean, I'll just use a medical model. 
Like, so if somebody has a, let's say a cancer and I rec- we recommend a certain thing and they choose something else, which they have the right to do, we have an obligation to document that they were offered this and they didn't, right? So one of the answers I'll get from people is, well, he was really sensitive to all these sounds. So we had to turn down the high tone. And you know, as well as I do, at the beginning of a fitting, that's a very common complaint, right? And so I don't have a problem with that, but I would challenge our other colleagues in the field that you actually should document that. Like, look, you actually need more gain in the high tones and you're not getting it because your brain's not accommodating and we really should be working to get your brain and your ears to accommodate. If there was a note to that effect, I totally, I get what you're saying about not throwing our colleagues under the bus. I hate to tell you this, I think there are some people that do that. I think, unfortunately, some of them just, frankly, don't know better. And that that becomes a, this is a bigger issue than you and I are ever going to solve and, on this podcast. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, in our practice, we use the gold standard. We use real air verification, which is something that I didn't have access to previously. And I really didn't understand it. I don't think I was trained enough to fully, right. like, grasp the importance yeah. of it. but. Um, what I would say is that through the verification piece, which they see in our office when we're going through it, the only adjustment that I make once they're, once we've done real ear verification is I will copy it and create a second program. And I just decrease the volume until it's comfortable. Right. And then by the follow-up, we You're go gonna back them to up it. to it. Correct. Yep. Right. So then we transition them and usually they're easily transitioned and they're counseled, right? No, they know. And yeah. so the concept of single fit is the whole, to me, one of the biggest problems in the hearing treatment space is the fact that uh, there's an aspiration through industry and some providers that you're going to come in, you're going to get your hearing technology and you're going to walk out and that's going to give you the best fit. And that's not our experience, right? Like, so for men for suits, women for dresses, like let's say maybe a wedding gown, for instance, nobody like got it, was given it once and said, okay, you're good to go. I mean, there's usually a fitting, a second fitting and a job, right? Like, so that's what I aspire is a bespoke hearing experience. And that's what I think you're offering. Yes, we do. And it's not for everyone. Look, you know, that's fine, but we really focus on if if you're not going to do it here, just do it. Right. Right. Like there's so much at stake that goes beyond like annoying your spouse (laughs) that I've seen firsthand. Right. Like I I don't, I don't want any, I never wished to have dementia uh, on anybody, but I'm already starting to see it on these patients that have like cognitive use scores that are very concerning and they're not treating their hearing loss. And so there's no cure for dementia right? There's cure for cancer, but there's not cure for dementia. It's it's prevention that matters. Right. So prevention, prevention, prevention. I mean, the Lancet study was huge, right? Like the number one modifiable risk factor for dementia. Agreed. Landmark. Landmark. Agreed. hundred percent. And so that's interesting. So um, kind of ballpark statistics. So you got my mind running. So you bring these people in, you now reprogram them to give them uh, best fit, right? What, so out of, let's say a hundred patients or let's say 10 patients who come to you for that evaluation, how many of them do not have the right technology? Oh, of the people that are already wearing? Right. Yeah. So that's, uh, so that's what I'm trying to think of, right? So like a hundred percent of them are wearing the wrong hearing. (laughs) So it never turns out that they have the right hearing aid on? I have not had that conversation. Is that because you find the dissatisfied, do you think? Or no, no, no. We test, right? We'll test them with their hearing aid. In fact, I will tell you this morning, I had a patient who got new hearing aids, the updated, I'm not going to talk about brands, but it was the new version of what she had. And we had tested her and she said, well, maybe I just need to put those settings into my old one and we'll, you know. And so I said, that's fine. Let's go. We'll do that. Right. And she did terribly. <laughs> you know, so, my heart is the patient who comes in and says, you know, I got these new hearing aids and I wore them for a while. And then I put my old hearing aids in and I actually do better with my old hearing aids. Right. 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 And yeah. that's, that's, that's not what we do here. And I said to this patient, I said, look, 
I'm not telling you something. Like, if this isn't the right hearing aid for you that you just got, I'm going to take it back. There's, I don't want you to struggle, but like, let's do the testing and compare apples to apples. You want to know if your old hearing aid is, can be fixed? Let's test. Let's do it. Let's do it apples to bath apples. I'll put your old, your new settings and your old hearing aids. We'll put the molds on them. We'll make them exactly the same. And she, I mean, her body language went from like the first test with all, with her new hearing aids was fine. It was like this. And then with the second one, she was like, like yeah. leaning forward and you can see like the wrinkles on her forehead, just struggling and concentrating. And she was like, oh, okay. Right. No, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, uh, you're you're striking the thing. I, 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 patient's subjective assessment of their ability to hear sometimes is right, but often is wrong. Right. And they have so much invested. I mean, you know, um, uh, the I forget the name, but there's an effect. Like, you know, when you measure uh, industrial production on a production floor, the fact that you measure it increases uh, people's productivity. And to the extent that people have to believe when they buy new hearing aids or get new hearing aids. Um, that they're better. They almost believe it, even if they're not many of them. Right. And I mean, some people it's like, well, is it really worth that much? You know, I just think, I just think as a profession um, and in this field, we can do so much better. Oh my God. Well, and the thing I would say to people, is it the painter or the paint? Is it the mason or the bricks? Right. And so they're all fixated on the bricks and the paint when it's really the craftsman who puts it together. And that's what you're doing. You're creating right. a craftsman type experience, which is really uh, wonderful. And I really uh, love that how you kind of evolved, you know, came to this uh, through, I mean, these are the same things I think about in terms of problems all the time. Right. It's about being different, right? Like you can't rely solely on one thing to grow your practice. You have to be different. And not only do you have to be different, you have to do it better. Like there's a better way out there. And the HEAR method treatment program was the synthesis of me understanding. And it's always evolving. It's not stagnant. We've added things. We added cognitive. We've done lots of different things. When patients say, oh, you should do this. Oh, okay. Like let's add that because that maybe is more meaningful and we're going to be doing something else soon with with it. It's always evolving, but it's evolving to help our patients in a truly meaningful way with their brain hearing ability. And so, uh, Greg, you know, um, how do you, so you do the hearing and noise uh, quicks in, I assume, with the, the mm -hmm. afterwards, do you do other assessments from uh, other functional testing, surveying, uh, cognitive? What, what do you do in terms of? I mean, we do the cognitive view. Um, there's other, we don't do many other assessments. Um, our health intake has a lot of other things yeah. going on in uh, assessing. About further along in the journey though. So, oh, oh yeah. So the so treatment program, back, right. They come back. I mean, that's the other thing, right? It's not, te it's not technology acquisition. It's a treatment plan. And so, exactly. so when you, let's say, I mean, I know you have your probably accommodation first three to four months, et cetera, et cetera. I would assume that you're cleaning and checking the device to make sure it's working on a regular basis. So what, what else do you do? Like at one year, is there something you do to assess them? Do you do the quick mm -hmm. again and show them that they're doing well or what do you do? Yeah. So there's a lot of other things. We like to see our patients every four months because from experience, booking those appointments every four months when they, before they leave the office is really key to their success. And they, they know that it's not just, here's your acquisition, here's your hearing aid and your box. Come back and right? see that's, that's Costco. That's, no one else wants to see you. The, the, that's other places. But Those places that profit by not seeing you. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to see you. They want I the mean, quick and dirty. Right? It's, it's, they save money by not seeing, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They want that one check. Right. Um, so, which we can talk about separately, but... Uh, um, but again, uh, I'm, I, 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 for the listeners in the beginning of the warm up, I said, you know, I, I want to emphasize the positive things we can fix rather than how what is broken. So that's that's where I like to go. So so I will add that, yes, there is a lot that happens in those four month appointments, um, retesting their hearing, Cognivue, Redux, 
um, checking for, I mean, you name it, it's happening and it's ongoing. Um, but I will add that something that really, and this is a can of worms, I'm sorry, I'm going to open up. No, it's okay. Uh, we charge for our services. And just like you, you're a physician. You would never like allow somebody to walk out the door after an hour and a half of their time and have spent zero dollars. Like, what the hell? That's not a professional. Right. So, so our appointments are an hour and a half with the provider and we've charged for those appointments. And so they're getting a lot of valuable information, whether they decide to, to start treatment or not. That's an hour and a half of my time. So are you talking about your initial consultation or your, oh, yeah. your follow-ups an hour and a half as well? Oh, so yes, we your- are unbundled. We are unbundled. And I believe that there are a lot of different financial options for patients. We have um, a four-year treatment program that some patients decide to use, um, but some people choose to pay as they go. But that initial consultation, which is an hour and a half, whether they do something or not, that that's my time. And right. so I think professionally, um, that's a whole, like I said, this is a can of worms, but I don't think that as a provider, if you want to be respected as a doctor of audiology, you need to charge for your service. Sure. I don't disagree. You not bundle it or include it or come in for a free, like it's very transparent to patients who are looking and shopping around when they see a free coupon for $500 off. What the hell are you trying to sell something? Correct. So, just... Yeah. So Hearing Doctors of New Jersey is walk-in. It's a clean, professional. It looks like all the other doctor's offices um, because that's what we are. Uh, great. I mean, I think it's great that you're uh, embracing that that whole uh, concept. And so what does your, you know, I mean, so it's an interesting thing. You were talking about your four-year treatment plan. That is a visit every four months. Yeah. And, and what do you do on it? Do you do something more on the year anniversaries or how does, what does that look like? Yeah. So annually, because we see our patients every four months, annual, we'll catch them at the four, at the one year mark where we repeat hearing their test. We repeat Cogniview. We um, do, if we need to make an adjustment, we do real ear verification again. Like there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of things that are happening on an ongoing basis and building value for that patient to know that like this is way different than where they were before if they had been before. So yeah, no, I agree. I'm just trying to, you know, I think it's great that you've thought about it all the way down the road. And so I assume obviously um, at three or four years, you start doing quicks in with other technology to see if there's an iterative improvement in the current technology relative to their or in the new technology relative to their current technology, if they can get improvement. So rather than the kind of, we give you new hearing aids every three, four years, uh, it sounds like yours is based on um, your method, right? So, I mean, you know, sadly, there are people who have a substantial decrease in their ears, maybe in the first two years. And so what you guys chose together at the initial visit might not any longer uh, rehabilitate their hearing loss. Right. So that conversation is an ongoing one. And for most of our patients, um, we start with an upfront conversation that we treat hearing loss in 48 month increments or four year increments, because we know that hearing loss is a progressive degenerative disease. And that the treatment that you start on day one is not gonna be the best treatment that you need in four years time. It may be a little sooner, but right? Like the technology changes, your brain hearing health changes, like all these other things change that to be upfront about what the expectation is, because when somebody says, oh my gosh, I spent all this money on these hearing aids and they're going to last me a lifetime, right? It's like, no. And that's our answer. It's not just no, it's these are the reasons why. And so the technology changes, your brain changes. It's Mm -hmm. a moving, it's a, it's a dynamic issue. That's why it's a health issue, not a technology acquisition. Right. And it is, it's an, in my mind, it's, I, I don't want anyone else to be like my grandmaster. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. No, it's it's terrible. I that that I, I agree with you hundred percent. I mean, I don't talk about much how, how socially withdrawn my brother was from material loss, but it, it was profound and caused yeah. a lot of um, you know, sadness. So I, yeah. I, so no, I, I agree a thousand percent. So 
So this is great. I mean, I really admire the whole uh, system that you've come up with and and all that. For the listeners, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Ree Rosamond Nesson of the Hearing Doctors of New Jersey. Um, Ree, uh, if if people want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? I mean, I just named your practice, but where would they? How would they get a hold? So the easiest way is to find me online, um, hearingdoctorsofnj.com. And uh, that's that's honestly the easiest way. Our phone number, everything is there um, online and available to. He's on LinkedIn as well. I can. I'm on LinkedIn sometimes. I try to not be too social media. I am on social media, but try not to, you know, use my time wisely. <laughs> and so where do you see, you know, what are the things you're working on to, I mean, what I love about your process is, is it's not static. It's not, this is what I learned uh, when I went through my program. And uh, as you said, when you get enough experience, you'll figure out how to give people the right uh, technology. I, <laughs> I love the debunking of that concept. Um, where do you like, you know, so I think people like you, which uh, I identify with, are kind of continually curious and willing to iteratively improve what they're doing. So what are you iteratively working on right now? Because I'll bet you there's something. <laughs> Am I right? Well, right now we're in year two and a half, 2.5. Uh-huh. And there as <laughs> I growing my practice is obviously um, a big piece for right now. And eventually teaching other providers the HEAR method treatment program and being able to allow them to practice that in their practices because we're really evolving. But I think as a profession, we can do better and through differentiation. That's great. That, uh, that's awesome. Uh, the other question I love to ask people is what's your favorite sound? You knew uh, we talked about this. You said you listened to a, another episode, so you were prepared. So. Uh, I'm not trying to build it up too much, but you had some time to think about this. So this was a super easy question for me. Okay. Um, my favorite sound is the crunching of leaves. I love that. And I've the always like, when dry leaves those, in the fall, the ones that have dried the up. Dry leaves. When you step on that crunch, there is something about it that just makes me happy. So... Yeah, it's we're about to have the, fall. <laughs> I, I live in the desert, so we don't have the fall like we did, but you're actually bringing back, um, when I was a child, we used to build leaf forts, and we actually would go to these people's houses and break up their leaves to build our leaf fort. And mm-hmm. it was kind of funny, once my friends and I outgrew it, like the uh, woman said, well, where are you guys? I mean, because we had become kind of their leaf removers uh, because we were building leaf forts. So I, it is great. I do love that. I mean, they had these oak trees and they would have like a foot of leaves on their property. It was beautiful. Yeah. I like seek out where to step when I'm walking. If I see a brown leaf, I'm like, oh, I got to step on that one. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> that, that's, that's, a, that's a really great sound. And, uh, yeah. And I love, and you know, hearing people's, making sure that people can hear those sounds again is so important. So obviously, you know, a crunching leaf is a unique sound and it makes me happy, but, um, you know, helping people hear better is really yeah yeah agreed and i and uh again i want to reiterate i i sent your passion which i think is wonderful everybody this is uh dr re uh, rosamond nesson of hearing doctors in new jersey uh the re this has been a great episode um and i look forward to visiting with you again because i suspect what we talk about in a couple uh, at some unit of time you'll be doing things even better and more improved and have even greater insights to share with our audience so this has been wonderful thank you Thanks for coming on. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.